If you're a real estate investor or you want to be a real estate investor and you're looking for more funding for your deals, regardless of what your hard money lender would say or your mortgage broker or your banker or even your mother, it doesn't matter. You're in the right place. Hey, welcome to Real Estate Investing with Jay Connor. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority, coming to you from Moorhead City, North Carolina and my lands. I'm so excited to have you back here at the show. Welcome to being a part of the movement. We're now getting tens of thousands of downloads and listens every week and every month. And our followers are just continuing to grow. And so if you are brand new to the show, we talk about all things real estate investing, uh, single family houses, commercial deals. And I mean, you know, there's hundreds and hundreds of ways to be involved in real estate investing. And even though I'm known as the private money authority and, and I plug in real estate investors to get funding for their deals, when all cash is required, which is a lot of the time, sometimes, you know, there's a way to do this business where you don't even have to have private money. And so today I'm going to introduce him in just a moment. Not yet. Sorry for the shameless tease, but in just a moment, I'm going to be introducing to you a very good friend of mine, a colleague. We're in a mastermind together. And he's going to be going over some strategies with you that virtually, when it comes to doing the transactions, you don't need any money to speak of. So hopefully that was a good enough tease to keep you on. But before I bring my guest on, I've got a free gift that I want to give all of our listeners with no strings attached whatsoever. And that is I've got a free online class on demand waiting for you to attend whenever you want to. And this class that I've prepared for you will give you the five easy steps on how to get and teach you how I got over $2 million in funding for my deals in less than 90 days. So go check it out after the show. Right here's the website, www.jayconner.com forward slash money podcast. Go check it out and get plugged in for funding on your deals, regardless of your experience, your income, and your credit. It's got nothing to do with that. So on to my guest. i tell you one thing that God has blessed me with so abundantly, and that is for me to have such amazing guests here on the show since we started. And so let me tell you all about my friend, my friend and my colleague and smart, savvy real estate investor. His name is Brett. Snodgrass and Brett. Let me tell you a little bit about Brett before we bring him on. So Brett is the founder of Simple Wholesaling. He's headquartered out of Indianapolis, Indiana. He's been a phenomenal real estate investor now full-time since 2007. And God has blessed him also abundantly with much success. And he recognizes, and what I appreciate about Brett is that he gives God the glory and God the thanksgiving and gratefulness for providing him the opportunity, not only to bless his own family, but through his educational company and his educational platforms, he's blessed many, many other people. So his mission is first of all, to spread the kingdom of God and glory to you on, I mean, you know, thanks to you for that, uh, Brett, and not being ashamed of it, but also his mission is to empower real estate investors, assisting others in being very, very successful. And of course, it's no surprise that Brett has got a very, very positive reputation. Along with that, and I've been around him now for over a year and a half, he's a very, very humble guy. He's all about giving back and sharing the wealth of knowledge that he has learned ever since 2007. And he's one of the most phenomenal and successful wholesalers in the business that I know. And as I mentioned a second ago, before I started introducing Brett, what Brett's going to be talking to us about here on the show is how you can become involved in real estate investing with very, very, very little money of your own. So his deal is helping real estate investors get connected and locate and find the right properties for them to invest in. So he's got free educational content on his website. So we'll give out his website here in the show notes. And as we get into the interview with Brett, he'll be giving all that out to you. So um, as I say, he has also got a, uh, a meetup that's called Wholesaling Made Simple. 
uh, is a meetup organized. It's run by Brett for uh, the, there in the, the Indianapolis area as well. And stick around to the end of the show because uh, Brett's also going to be giving out information as to how you can get a copy of his free book that is also located at his website. So with that, my good friend, my fellow Christian and successful real estate entrepreneur who's knocking it out of the park up in Indiana, Brett, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Jay. Appreciate you having me. It's always an honor. And if you guys haven't listened to our podcast, the Simple Wholesaling Podcast, check out episode 124. And it is yours truly, Jay Connor. And uh, that's one of our most downloaded episodes, Jay, by the way. So, Are you kidding? Yeah, yeah. You knocked it out of the park, man. Wow. Wow. That's pretty cool to hear. Well, I appreciate that. Well, I'll tell you all, you know, I told you Brad is very, very successful. So it's taken me like, I don't know, it's taken my producer weeks to get Brett scheduled to get here on the show. So Brett, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule. So let me give everybody just a couple more teasers as to what we're going to talk about in this show. And we'll have these in the show notes as well, as far as bullet points. If time permits, and typically we go about 30 minutes or so, but if time permits on the show today, we want to talk about how you have learned and how you're able to share with other real estate investors how to scale your business, how to grow your business. I mean, recently you were doing five deals a month. You're now doing over 25 deals a month. I mean, that's like, let's see, double, triple, quadruple. I don't know how you say five times. Anyway, you've grown your business. You've scaled it. My guess is you've got some pretty cool automated systems in place in order to do that. So we're going to talk about that. You and I offline before we started the show with what's coming around the corner for real estate investors and real estate investing opportunities over the next couple of years. You've also discovered a pretty cool way very recently how to diversify your business and generate additional streams of income. So we want to talk about that. I also want to talk about your pretty cool ways that you find deals that's different from what other real estate investors do and some more fun stuff. So anyway, and you're going to have, you're going to have some advice for newbies and for seasoned real estate investors. So before we get into the meat and potatoes, Brett, please take just a moment and tell our audience well, how it is you're qualified to even talk about real estate investing. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, I'll definitely go into that. So I don't know if I'm the most qualified guest that you've had on the show, Jay, but I've been doing this about 12 years and I got into real estate investing in 2007 and I've done a lot of different aspects of real estate. I got into wholesaling right off the get-go because it was kind of the, the easiest level of entry in 2007, my dad and I were partners and we bought our first house and we made uh, $6,000 on that first house. And that's when the light bulb went off and we were like, wow, this is, this is great. And then in 2008, I actually did 150 of those types of deals and it just kind of took off from there. I've tried some fixing and flipping and you know, I've rehabbed the house or two in my day. So I think you've done a little bit of that, right, Jay? Uh, yeah, about 400 of them so far. Yeah. <laughs> so I've done that. But then a few years ago, I was fixing and flipping quite a few houses, but I realized that wholesaling was really where I was the best at. So that's when I developed Simple Wholesaling and I created a team to go with that company. And that's how we were able to scale to do, and, you know, we do, we're doing about 25 deals this month and that's pretty much what we average. So I call it a deal a day or we call purchase agreements PA. So we say a PA a day. That's what, that's what we try to do. So <laughs> that's our goal. I love it. I love it. So uh, yeah, you're qualified to talk about real estate investing. I mean, you know, you've been doing it for, since 2007 full time. Sounds like you've done all aspects of it from buying and flipping, wholesaling. Now I'll tell you, Brett, you know, particularly for, and here on my audience, we've got just a wide, we've got a varied group of people. We've got very, very seasoned real estate investors who are looking for that cutting edge as to what's going on right now in the market. And we've got those people that have never done their, you know, never, they haven't done their first deal yet that are tuning in. And so just to make sure we're on the same page, because, you know, I've got a number of good friends that are wholesalers 
by the way, I'll just be totally transparent to everybody here on the show. I've been in this business 15 years. I've yet to wholesale my first deal. Oh, I've never, I've never wholesaled a deal. So I'm here to learn how to wholesale deals. So let's make sure everybody's on the same page, Brett. In your world, real simple, since, since you're, you're known as simple wholesaling, <laughs> what is your definition of a wholesale deal? Yeah, definitely. So I think wholesaling companies are more like marketing companies. So uh, we take a lot of the different things out of real estate investing, but we really just market for deals. So that just involves a lot of different types of marketing. We do direct mail. We're always online. We're doing a lot of online marketing with Facebook and, uh, and Google AdWords. We're doing a lot of networking. So basically, our job is just to find the deals. I mean, it's the simplest way. We just, we just find deals that meet uh, what an investor is looking for. But at the same time, we're also looking for investors like Jay or many people in our mastermind group to buy those deals. And we're just basically a matchmaker. So we match the deal up with the investor, and then we just get a small fee in the middle. They're the guys, they're going to make a lot of the money on the flip or the rental. And we're just getting that small fee. And then in order for us to make a lot of money, we do volume. And that's what wholesaler, that's what their job is. It's not to make a killing on every deal. It's to make a small fraction on a lot of deals. So, Tell me if I understood your definition correctly. Am I saying this right? And if I'm not, fix it. So would you say your world of wholesaling is marketing to find deals. So, and the definition of a deal is you're able to buy it or control that property and to where it is a, has a potential, very lucrative potential profit for another real estate investor that's then going to take the deal and finish it out. If it needs rehabbing, somebody else is going to rehab it. They're going to get the end profit. And for you being the, say we call matchmaker, are you a matchmaker? We are a matchmaker, yep. Yeah. So you're a matchmaker between a seller of a property and a real estate investor that wants to make money on that property, put those two entities together. And in exchange for that, you make money and you, do you call that an assignment fee uh, that you're assigning the contract or the, or the option? Yeah, you can do an assignment fee. You can do it a couple of different ways. You can do a double closing. And I've done a lot of that. But just to kind of take you back a little bit, Jay, we've actually developed a little bit of a different model with what we do now. So when I first got started, we did a lot of assignment fees. And that's exactly what you just described. You know, you do the match with the investor with the deal, and you make that $5,000 assignment fee for, for putting that deal together. But we've actually learned, and, and I've talked to you, Jay, about raising private money. So we actually do it a little bit different than the typical wholesaler now, is we actually do close and, and buy the deal. So we do more of a wholesale model right now, where we buy it, and that helps us really control it because we can uh, call the shots, we can get people in the door, nobody's asking asking us questions, we can market it anywhere we want, and we don't have to always be looking over our shoulder so that's what we do now. And then we, uh, and then we sell it to another investor. So a little bit different model. And that does take a lot of money. But when I first got started for years, I was doing you know, the assignment way and then all that. So what are the advantages or benefits to actually, so are you using private money or are you using transactional funds? No, we use private money. So I have a lot of private lenders and we're always looking for private lenders that, you know, I have friends that have money, you know, doctors, lawyers, people that have money in their self-directed IRA, my family, you know, we don't have a lot, but I have about 10 or so private lenders that have, they've been investing with us for, for years. And that's, that's who we typically, transactional funding you mentioned, that's more of uh, if we're going to buy the property and sell the property the exact same day. That's when a transactional funder would come in. They have absolutely no risk. You know, they're getting their money the same day they lend it. Private money, though, is we don't do that. We buy it and then we don't sell it for, you know, it could be a week later, it could be three weeks later. And that's why we have to use the private money. Yeah. So, what are the benefits to you as the wholesaler 
or wholetailer to actually buy the property with private money versus getting an assignment fee to where you're just controlling it with a contract? Yeah, well, I think there's a lot of benefits. Number one, you know, whenever you get a property, a lot of these properties are just absolutely Really terrible. They're they're trashed, right? And what I mean terrible, they don't need just fixed up. They need cleaned out. We've had properties. We've had to clean out six thousand dollars worth of their personal belongings. Hello. So see, yeah, <laughs> right. So when we see a property like that, one of our strategies was: what if we buy buy uh, that property, we clean it out, and then we market it? Would we get a lot more traffic in the door? So that's one benefit. Another benefit is. When you're assigning the contract, you're pretty much stuck to your buyer's list. You send the property out and that's where you're selling the property. Uh, but if you own it, you can market it to your buyer's list. You can market it on the MLS. You can market it on any website that you want to because you own the property. So you get a lot more action that way and you can sell it for more money at the end of the day because you get a lot more eyes on it rather than just sticking to your lane of buyer's list, right? That's why we do Right. It. So are you saying that when you actually buy the property with private money, that you have more exit strategies to choose from and as a result have more ways to make more money? That is correct. Yes, exactly. In the simplest terms, Jay. All right. So everybody, here's the shameless bribe. If you want to do Brett's model, be sure to go over to my free class that I just offered on how to get the private money so you can do his model. Anyway, <laughs> so, so that's pretty cool, Brett. That's pretty cool. Now, let me ask you this. Do you end up staying in some of the deals that you buy? And since you're buying them with private money instead of uh, wholesaling them to another real estate investor? Does he mean staying as in, uh, do we do we hold them? Do we rent them? Yeah, in other, word, in other words, do you, so, I mean, my lands, I mean, my lands, you're doing 25 plus deals a month. I'm thinking, you mm -hmm. know, your intended exit strategy when you buy a property may be to wholesale it or wholetail it. But then once you get into a property and you see what you got, I would think sometimes, maybe not, that you go, hey, maybe I want to stay in this deal and see it to the very end and make the sixty or $70,000 versus what you might do on wholetail? Or do you just let the market speak and whoever shows up with whatever you like, that's who gets it? Yeah. Well, our main strategy is to wholetail it or wholesale it at first. So we typically start out there. But yes, there are properties that you know we have rented and we hold for a rental for a while. I, I have a handful of rentals now that were wholesale deals that turned in uh, to rentals that we just kind of cherry picked and just said, you know what, this is going to make a great buy and hold property. And then lately, one of our best strategies that we've been using is the seller financing model. So instead of selling the property, we do the exact same way. We buy it, we close it, we clean it out. But instead of selling it for cash, we sell it with seller financing in place and we're able to collect you know, 10%, 12% interest on that asset for years to come. So that's something that we're just getting into in the last year or so as well. Cool. So two questions. To make sure we're all on the same page, please tell the audience, what's the difference between wholesaling and wholetailing? So wholesaling is basically you don't have any money into the deal except for maybe a nominal fee like earnest money. Maybe it's $100, $500. And that's pretty much it. There's a lot of money into marketing for that particular deal. But when you get the deal, there's you don't buy it. There's not a lot of money into it. Uh, and then, like I said, you're matchmaking. So basically, instead of closing on that particular deal, you're really just selling the purchase agreement for a fee. So you sign a purchase agreement for $100,000 Instead of buying that property for $100,000, you sell that $100,000 purchase agreement for $10,000. You're selling that piece of paper. You're selling the paper, yes. So you're selling your control of the property. So that's wholesaling. Wholesaling is same thing. Find the deal. You're buying it for $100,000. You close on it. So you have to have $100,000, whether it's from you or a private lender. And then you can do, you control it, and then you sell it to another investor. But 
you have more exit strategies. So maybe instead of selling it for a $10,000 assignment, maybe you sell it for $116,000 uh, because you have more ways uh, to sell the property. Yeah. Well, clearly in any business, the more exit strategies and options that you have, when you have a piece of inventory, a piece of inventory, then clearly, you know, the more options and, and ways that you have to make money. Now, let's drill down. Let's take just a second for the benefit of our more advanced real estate investors. And then we'll come back in just a moment and carry on the discussion for everybody. So let's talk for a moment about selling a property, a house, a single family house with seller financing. So you're going to sell it with seller financing and you have funded that deal with private money. Now, let me make sure our audience knows where we're going with this conversation because I just laid the facts out, but there's a question that goes with that. So here's, so everybody, here's what I'm, here's what I'm getting ready to ask Brett. The question is how can you borrow money from a private lender? And by the way, folks, a private lender is nothing more than an individual. It's a person just like Brett, just like me. You know, I've got 48 private lenders right now funding our deals, individuals, human beings. So the question is, how can we as real estate investors borrow money from a private lender to fund a deal, to fund a house for us to buy? And then while we still have that note in place where we're owing money to a private lender, how can we simultaneously turn right around and sell that single family house or property with, with seller financing in place? Well, that's a great question, Jay. So I'm pretty new at all this. Uh, I just took a, a class. We mentioned before the show, Eddie Speed. I think he's been on your show. I took a class with Eddie and he's, he's been teaching me uh, some, some of these different strategies but how I have done it, and there's a couple of different ways you can do it. Uh, so you buy a property for $100,000, you get private money for that property, and then you go to sell it just like you would for cash, except instead of selling it for cash, let's say you sell it for $135,000 with seller financing. So that person, they come and they're going to put a down payment down. Maybe it's $20,000. So you get that $20,000 now. And then there's a couple of different ways. You can sell it on a land contract and you, you can keep your loan in place. So they're making you payments, but you're making your private lender payments too. And that's, that's one way. Or you can do what they call a mortgage and note wrap, which is they, uh, you sell them the property and you keep your, your private lender's mortgage and note in place, but then they have a, another note and mortgage on it as well. So again, it's, this, it's a similar concept. You know, the big shots, the professionals would say to do the, the mortgage note and wrap. Some people in the Midwest, they like the land contracts. So it just depends, depends on what you're wanting to do, but that's, that's a couple of options. But I think disclosure is huge. And, you know, we disclose that, you know, we, we have a note on this property and, and I think that that's the biggest thing is just full disclosure. Sure. Well, and you know, you mentioned land contract. I mean, another good friend of mine, uh, do you by chance know Mitch Stevens? Maybe you know Mitch, maybe not, you know, Mitch. Yeah, he's uh, been on our show too. Oh, there you go. Well, you know, Mitch, his big thing is this same concept with the, doing the wraps and the seller finance and et cetera. And a large part of his uh, buyers are the uh, Hispanic population because he's in San Antonio mm -hmm. and, you know, he's very flexible to work with, you know, verifications of income and that type of thing. But the reason I thought of Mitch is because I know he uses land contract. He uses mm -hmm. land contract uh, a lot in Texas as well. Now, so anyway, by the way, you did an excellent job explaining <laughs> the process there on how you do private money and, seller financing, you know, also, you know, simultaneously, what would you say is your average wholesale fee? And what would you say is your average wholetail profit? So we're right now we're doing a lot of the wholetailing. So, uh, you know, we're in Indianapolis, so our price points are a lot lower uh, here. 
And some people are making a lot more margins than, than what we do. But just to give you an example, our average prices in Indianapolis are typically between 20000 to like 50000 That's probably like 65% of our business. We do a lot higher than that too. But 65% of our business is, is below 50000 So you can't make 30000 on a $25,000 property very easily. So right now our margins are about 7000 7500 per deal. That's kind of our wholesale, our wholesale fee and uh, assignment fees are less than that. You know, probably more, more like around five, a little bit over five or so. I got you. So, what would you say is your in your area is your bread and butter, three bed, two bath, fourteen hundred square foot house that's all fixed up, ready to go? What's your entry level price point for say a First time home buyer on an on a nice home that's you know all fixed up, ready to go. Yeah, it really just depends. I mean, Indianapolis, anybody will tell you it goes street by street, neighborhood by neighborhood. You know, if you're in a cookie cutter village, the you know, the vinyl villages built in nineteen or maybe like two thousand, uh, a three bedroom, two bath, those are probably gonna be 120,000, 125,000. If you're in more of the inner city Indianapolis and you get a three bed, one bath uh, built in 1950, those are, you know, 50 to $70,000. So that kind of maybe helps you a little bit with that. Gotcha. Yeah, I was curious because right here in our area in eastern North Carolina, of course, we're near the water. Okay. So we're near a resort area, but pretty much our entry level price point, three bed, two bath. I mean, it's such a hot market where we are right now. Nobody's moving in for less than $150,000, $160,000 on, mm-hmm. say, a 1,300, 1,400 square foot house. So let's, let's advance it forward, Brett. We told the audience at the beginning of the show we were going to talk about some of these other things. So I'm really curious, and I know my audience is too, how is it that you're able to scale your business so quickly? How do you go from doing five deals a month in such a short period of time to averaging 25 and more deals a month? Yeah, I think it's just uh, once you find out how to do a wholesale deal and you just find out the the logistics of, you know, how to get deals, how to sell deals and the process of from beginning to end, it's pretty easy. And really, it's just kind of by developing a team. And that's really what we've done. Uh, So really when I'm doing, you know, a few deals a month, I'm a one man show and you can only do so many deals just being that one man band. And so I decided to start hiring some people and we're up to about 10 people now. I have about eight local people and I have a couple of virtual assistants out of the Philippines that are lovely, awesome workers and really just kind of putting the pieces together and then teaching them the system. And it's really just about creating that system. So when I say it's really not different from doing five deals to 25 deals, it's really all the same process. But, you know, if I add a person, I expect to do a few more deals. And, and this just kind of went from there. So when you add 10 people, you expect to do, you know, uh, five times as many deals. So that's kind of how it goes. So I would just say, you know, putting the right people in the right place. So really, it's just developing that. How, how do you build the business? Uh, with that. And that's what we've been able to do here, just learning the system and then putting the right people in the right places and in the system. So, Okay. So that triggers this question. So when you were a one-man show, you're doing two or three or four deals a month kind of deal. But now you've got, you know, you got eight to 10 people. You got a couple of virtual assistants. You got eight local people. What are the different tasks? So, if, so if, if we got somebody here listening to the show that wants to start automating their business and growing their business, what do you have these different people doing to automate your business? Yeah, well, in wholesaling, uh, it, all, it all starts with the acquisitions. So if you don't have a good acquisitions team finding your deals, then you don't have any business, right? So it all starts with that. So you have to find out who's going to answer the phones. That's one of the biggest painful, you know, jobs of this is just answering, talking to people. Who's going to look at the deals? That's called the acquisitions manager. He's going out, he's taking pictures, he's meeting with sellers. This is a good salesman. So you can have as many as you want. 
Then there's the closing coordinator. And this is the administrative piece. We're making sure, you know, there's a lot of paperwork. There's a lot of, you know, administrative tasks that go into it. So finding a closing coordinator. And then there's the dispositions team. And they're the ones who are going to sell your deals. So they got to be talking to investors, building your buyer's list, marketing your deals. So someone talking to all the investors. And then beyond that, there's, you know, a marketing person. So you got to send out a lot of marketing. You know, we have a COO who's Brian. He's kind of running the operations. It can go from there. But honestly, acquisitions, starting, find a closing coordinator, develop a, a good dispositions team. And that, those are the only areas you really need uh, in this business. Gotcha. So you mentioned at the beginning of the show that when I was saying, well, really, what is wholesaling? You said really wholesaling, and I'll put it in my words and paraphrase, is a marketing machine is what it is. You're marketing to find deals. You're marketing to find buyers of your deals, et cetera. And you know, Brett, my guess is your business in uh, Indiana is much like my business in North Carolina from this standpoint. And that is some of my marketing methods that was just knocking it out of the park two, two and a half, three years ago is like (laughs) not getting it done today. And I have switched up and like, you know, some of the marketing that I'm now doing today, I don't even, I hadn't even heard of, you know, three years ago. And so, you know, with any business, the marketing methods change, how you locate deals changes, Right now in your market, what would you say is one or two or three or whatever? What are some of your top favorite strategies on your team locating deals? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Well, I don't think it's like we don't do anything crazy different than anybody, uh, anybody else. Of course, you know, we're still doing the direct mail method and it's gotten a lot less here lately because it's pretty competitive out there. But you know, it's still making us money and uh, we're still making three to four times as much as what we spend. So I'm, I'm still cranking it out, even though it's a little more difficult. We do a lot of online. So we do Google AdWords. We have, a, you know, somebody types in, hey, I want to sell my house cash in Indianapolis. We're like right there, number one on Google. Nice. Uh, so we have some help with that. But, you know, our number one strategy is actually probably different than most people. And it really just kind of comes from the networking the networking model. So we host our own simple wholesaling meetup. We train wholesalers how to wholesale in our market, which is probably a lot different, but we're the authority when it comes to, to who who are they going to bring their deals to? Uh, So they bring their deals to us. And then we're able to work with a lot of the, the local wholesalers here. And honestly, probably half our business comes that way. Nice. So you have a, is it a monthly in-person meetup group? Yeah, we have a monthly in-person. So we do a presentation. We, we typically do things, a tip. Uh, we do good deal, bad deal. And we go through a couple of our deals saying, this was awesome. Here's what happened. This was a bad deal. Here's what happened. And then people love it. We usually get about 60 people there. And then we're starting to put on trainings here locally. So we're taking a handful of wholesalers that really want to scale their business. But then obviously, you know, we're working with them. So we're getting a, you know, a piece of their deals as well. So just kind of working with the competition rather than against, I feel like has, has helped us so much. So. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. You know, I, I tell my story to my students sometimes, you know, I'm in a small area. I mean, my total target market's only 40,000 people Wow. and every and everyone. So what's your target market? What's your population? I mean, Indianapolis and in the surrounding areas is, and the surrounding county is probably 1.8 million. Got you. So anyway, so every once in a while, one of the gurus will come to Greenville, North Carolina, which is maybe like an hour and a half away and put on a one day workshop. And then all of a sudden, the following week, I'll start seeing these we buy houses signs <laughs> pop up in my little old Moorhead City, North Carolina. And I'm going, okay. Who has now shown up in my sandbox wanting to play in my sandbox? And and the reason I'm thinking of this story, Brett, is because really it's so much easier to work with the competition if you want to call the competition the competition. Because I tell folks, you know what? If you just show up and call people back, you're ahead of the competition. You really don't have any competition. But every once in a while, one of these new signs will show up and I'll call them up. 
and I'll say, hey, this is Jay. I've been here 15 years. Come join the party. But if you come across a deal that they require all the cash and you don't have the funding, call me up. I got money for your deal. So, <laughs> so that, that reminds me of what you're doing to train and educate and work with your local people. It's so much easier. I mean, it's sort of like tenants, you know, yeah. or, or rent to own buyers. It's so much easier to work with them than to work against them when you have, you know, issues pop up and that type of thing. My lens, Brett, I can't believe how fast the time is going by. <laughs> so your crystal ball, you know, you've been in the business now for 2007. Markets change, markets come, markets go. What are you seeing going on right around the corner? And what should we as real estate investors or new real estate investors be aware of and be thinking about? Yeah, definitely. So I got in in 2007 and one of the best years that we had was 2008. And a lot of people were saying that was the worst time ever to get in real estate. And I just didn't really know what I was doing. I was just buying cheap REO properties and that was what was happening. So I haven't been in that market since then. And I have not been on the other side where I started in 2005 and then it tanked, right? So my crystal ball is, I mean, nobody really knows but I hear what people are saying and they're saying that the market is tightening up. It's softening. Properties are staying on the market longer than what they used to be. I'm seeing flip areas here not be as hot as what they were last year. So that, that's just some things that, that I'm thinking about. So what we're doing in that is, is, you know, I used to be a basketball player. My dad was a basketball coach and here all the time, you say, don't, you know, don't worry about what everybody else is doing and the competition, just play, just do you just play your game and do it really well. So we're not going out and we're not doing anything crazy and doing a bunch of different markets that we don't know anything about. We're just staying with what we know and we're doing it really, really well because I feel like that's what we're going to do here for the next year or two. Uh, so those are real estate Say investors out there, if I were you, I wouldn't do anything crazy and do these special crazy niches that you know nothing about. I would just you know learn one thing, focus on it, and, and really just stick stick with that here. And then when the market is, is softening and it's lower, then maybe you got some some chances to take some more risks. But that's what we're doing. We're just playing our game. Excellent, excellent. So, what advice do you have for the new real estate investor that has not done their first deal yet? Yeah, you know, this is always, you know, a great question. And there's always the, you know, the always certain answers that people always say, find a mentor, uh, go to your local meetups, things like that. You know, and I think all those are great. I think you should find uh, someone and I don't know, maybe if a mentor is, is the right keyword, because I, I don't like people come up and say, hey, will you mentor me? And that's just kind of like, uh, you know, I'm not really sure about it. But I do really, really recommend just find someone who's doing it. And just kind of do what they do. Uh, don't don't blaze your own trail. Uh, just copy what what the big dogs are doing, and that's what I would just recommend to someone. And I would really really recommend going and working with a company at first. You know, I've had the pleasure of training people in our company, and now some of them are out doing on their own. And I don't feel badly about that. I'm like, wow, that's such a compliment that I was able to train them, and now they can do it on their own here a few years later. So I would just recommend, yeah, going and playing with a company that's already doing it and start, start learning the ropes. To be a successful wholesaler. And I mean, you know, you've been around the block for quite a while now, of course you're in a big market, you know, you're in Indianapolis, but given your other friends and colleagues that are not in such large markets or as big as you are, how important is it to be in, let me ask it a different way. What size market do you think someone needs to be in to really focus on the wholesaling business? I.e., how big of a market do you need to be in to where there's actually a list of cash buyers, real estate investors for you to, you know, assign or sell deals to? Well, yeah, that's a great question, Jay. That's something that we definitely uh, think about. I have recently actually moved to a uh, it's a decently large city. It's bigger than yours. It's probably about 400,000. It's Fort Wayne, Indiana. And I think definitely I see wholesalers uh, doing that type of market. If you're in a small town, maybe 40,000 people, I don't know. I think it would be, I think it would be difficult. 
because I feel like the more, the smaller that you get, you know, you don't have people from California knocking on your door. You don't have people from all over the nation wanting to buy houses in your market. You have local people. So as far as a number goes, I don't know. I mean, I feel like people could, could do it in our market with, you know, a few hundred thousand people. So I, if I were in a small town, I would look for probably the next biggest city that, that's closer to me. And I would kind of look, look there. I think it'd be difficult in a small town, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know why I asked the question, because here I am in a town of 40,000 people. And quite frankly, I'm a big fish in a very, very small pond. But um, you're really close to, to a big town, right? Is it Greenville? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Greenville. Of course, that's a college town. Yeah. There's probably, I don't know, 100, 100, no, maybe 100, 200,000 people, something mm-hmm. like that. Of course, we got Wilmington's about 90 miles away. However, I'm not complaining. I'm enjoying an average profit of sixty-seven thousand dollars per deal, and do two or three of them. Do two or three of them a month, and you know, <laughs> bam. So, Brett, up front at the beginning of the show, we promised our audience that you were going to give out access to the free book that they can get on your website. How people can get involved in wholesaling if they want to. But before we do, I got one last question, and then we'll mm-hmm. give out the free stuff. Okay, so. Clearly, you are not ashamed of your faith. It's in your bio. It's on your website. The first time I met you about a year and a half ago, as of today's date, you were speaking on the stage and you were talking about your core values and you were talking about your faith and you didn't, you weren't ashamed of mentioning God in your talk. And so my question is, really, really, really? How important is your faith and your involvement in your, I don't know, what, to whatever degree you're involved in activities that tie in with your faith or church, et cetera, that you would actually say is a part or large part of your success? And if the answer is yes, how and why? Yeah, well, definitely. Well, you know, I know we don't have a lot of time with the show, but uh, I've lived a lot of my life not having faith, just to kind of put it out that, that out there. You know, I gave my life to Christ when I was 30, which was about, you know, eight and a half years ago. And it's just kind of changed my life. So I feel like if you have given your life to Christ, uh, then you already are successful. It doesn't matter how much money you have in the bank. So from there, I just kind of built this company. I was a Christian man. I was a man of faith. And I said, I'm not going to compromise that for any amount of money or any amount of success or business that the world tells me about. So I just kind of started building it. And the first couple of guys happened to be men of faith. And we started praying before our meetings. And, and it just kind of built from that. And uh, since then, I've just been, you know, a lot of the people that we do bring in are people that that have seen our website, that have uh, seen our, our meetup, that have seen a lot of our videos that are attracted to that piece of us, you know, of our faith. So they're people of faith as well. And that's who we've been able to bring into our organization. Um, so it's huge. At the end of the day, it, you know, if this whole thing falls apart, and, and, but we still have that. It's just, it's so awesome. So I'm just not going to be ashamed or compromise for anything. So if it hurts us and we make a few extra, a few less dollars, it, I don't care. So that's, that's the bottom line, I think. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate you sharing that. And you know, you were just saying that you have attracted people that are also people of faith. You know what that reminds me of, Brett? I don't know who in the world ever came up with the phrase opposites attract. They must've been smoking dope or something because <laughs> I'm telling you, who do you want to hang around? You want to hang around people that are like you? We right. well, hang around people that don't have the same core values of you. Of course, you want to hang around the people that are like you. And, you know, I'm a national trainer doing about 25, 30 events a year. And, you know, you go to speaker school, you go to the speaker boot camp training and all that. And they say, never talk politics, never talk religion from the stage. Well, I don't talk politics because I've just never been drawn to it. However, I didn't follow the advice of speaker boot camp. Speaker boot camp says never talk about your faith, never talk about religion, never talk about who it is you believe in, because you're going to turn some people off. And you know what I've discovered? And the reason I'm sharing this is not just to share with other people that might be 
trainers or like yourself, educating other real estate investors. I'm saying this to everybody that's listening to the show right now, whether you've downloaded it or you're just listening, and that is whatever your core values are, whether they are, whether you agree with my core values or Brett's core values or you don't. The point is express who you truly are, whatever that is, express who you truly are. And I promise you, you will connect with more people than trying to keep your filter on your face and not letting people know who you are. Because if you don't take your filter off, you're going to have to live with what I call and what I've heard, imposter syndrome. Let people know who you are and whoever you are, you will attract more of those people to you, whatever that is. Do you agree, Brett? Yeah, I totally agree. Totally agree. And that was one of the best things that I did, did years ago was I came up with five core values in our business. And I even, I've done that same thing with my life. And uh, just to kind of always go back to that when you're trying to make a decision about who to hire, who to fire, or what, what to do with your life. It's just something that you have in front of you to, uh, you know, does this decision match who I am? So uh, that's just super helped me. So I just recommend that to anybody out there. I love it. So I know we've got like one minute left for people to learn how to connect with you, continue the conversation, learn how to get the free book on your website. But can you take 30 seconds? And I know you can't expound on it, but can you share your five core values or do I need to have you back on the show for part two? <laughs> no, no, definitely. So yeah, that's our, our five core values. So number one is be a faithful servant. So, you know, we always want to get, get to heaven and God says, you know, well done, good and faithful servant. So we want to serve our clients, serve our lenders, serve anybody that we come into contact with. Uh, number two is mission minded. So that's more of like, Hey, we want to be a missionary. Uh, we want to go over the top to just to kind of have the mission. What's our purpose as a company to bring opportunity, have that mission in mind. Number three is leaving a lasting impression. Our closing coordinator, our person that goes all the closing, she does super wonderful. With this. She, she's bringing title company cookies and brownies and so nice. Just, you know, are you leaving that lasting impression when you walk out that door? Are they going to remember you and how are they going to remember you? So they're leaving a lasting impression. Number four, simple and smart systems. So this is what we've been able to scale with. So we're always trying to think about how can we be smarter? How can we be simpler? I don't like complicated systems. Make it simple uh, so I can understand it. And then number five, and I really like this one is, I asked my business coach, what was the one thing that you regret that you didn't do while you were building your business? And he said, I wished that I would have enjoyed the ride. And so that's just one thing, just have fun and just enjoy this. Sometimes we're climbing this mountain and we're just miserable for the next five, 10, 20 years, right? And then we get to the top and now, we're, now we can be happy. Uh, so I just think that that's just super crucial. Just enjoying, enjoy the climb. So those are our five, Jay. Man, Brett, I mean, that right. That, hey, look, your next book you write, that should be the that should be what your book is about. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. That's awesome. So, Brett, I know um, a good uh, share of my audience would love to connect with you, would love to continue the conversation, would love to get your free book that you have to offer. So please let everybody know how they can connect with you and get the book and, and, and all that. Yeah, well, definitely. Well, you can go to our website, which is simple wholesaling.com. We got some great educational resources on there. Uh, you can download our free ebook, which basically is just how to get started in wholesaling. And we also have our podcast on there. So you can subscribe to the simple wholesaling podcast with Brett Snodgrass and our, and our properties are on there too. So, you know, we, it's just kind of if you're interested in Indianapolis or or private lending or whatever, just connect with me on there. Emails Brett B R E T T at Simple. That's great, Brett. That's great. So just to make sure everybody knows that the website. So for those of you that are listening and not watching on one of the YouTube channels, it's www.simplewholesaling.com, and that's spelled simple S I M P L E. Whole W H O L E sailing S A L I N G dot com. And again, Brett's email address is Brett B R E T T at simple wholesaling dot com. I tell you, Brett, I can't tell you how wonderful it has been to have you here on the show. I mean, just simply fantastic. Another breath of fresh air. 
And uh, man, I could talk to you all day and just thank you so much for opening up your heart and, you know, sharing your core beliefs and what it is that's important to you. Jay, it's a pleasure to be on the show and I appreciate it, everything that you do. And it's a breath of fresh air to talk to you. All right. Thank you so much, Brett. All right, everybody. Thank you for joining in. And thank you again, Brett. Looking forward to seeing everybody on the next show. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority. Looking forward to seeing you soon. And here's to taking your real estate investing business to the next level. Bye-bye.